Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 10th session of Seismic Academy, hosted by the UFT Seismic Design Team. Today, we'll talk about structural analysis, which is adapted from the SIP 214 Structural Analysis 1 course. Um, this course covers a lot of concepts, but I've selected topics that are related to deflections as a start. Um, if there's enough interest, we might host additional se sessions to cover the other topics in this course. Um, so just a little bit about me. Um, my name is Shirley, and I just finished third year at the University of Toronto. I am one of the two co-captains on the team. Um, yeah, I'll be presenting uh, in this presentation today. So just a brief overview um, to what we will be talk what I'll be talking about today. I'll start with um, an introduction to deflections and why we should study them, um, followed by um, deflection diagrams and some some ex examples um, to explain how to draw deflection diagrams. Um, then I'll move on to elastic beam theory and um, its associated double integration method to quantify deflection. Um, and I will end with a slide on fixed moments. So first of all, why should we study deflections? Um, well, deflections of structures, uh, they can occur from various sources, such as um, loads, temperature, fabrication errors, and settlement, et cetera. Um, so in design, deflections must be limited in order to provide integrity and stability of roofs um, and prevent cracking of the attached brittle materials, such as um, concrete and glass. Um, and also a structure shouldn't vibrate or deflect so severely um, so that it would appear safe for the occupants of a structure. And more importantly, deflections at specific, um, specific points in the structure have to be determined if someone wants to analyze solidly indeterminate structures. So before I talk about deflection theory, um, we have a couple of assumptions and simplifications um, that we make to um, simplify the theory. So um, the deflections that are considered in this presentation apply only to structures um, that have a linear elastic material response. So under this condition, um, a structure subject to, subjected to a load will return to its original undeformed position after the load is removed. And the deflection of the of a structure um, is caused by internal loading, such as the, the normal force, shear force, or bending moment. Um, but for beams and frames, uh, the greatest deflections are, are often caused by the internal bending, whereas um, for truss, the deflection is mainly caused by internal axial forces. So if you look at the diagrams on the right, um, I'll ex explain this further in the next few slides, but the main thing to note is that um, there is a difference between how like a roller or a pin would uh, react or how um, a, a member close to a roller or a pin, pin would react compared to um, a member that's attached to a fixed support. So as you can see, a member that's attached to a roller or a pin would deflect with an angle, um, because, uh, well, uh, whereas um, a member that's attached to a fixed support um, stays horizontal at the interface. So I'll, I'll, I'll explain um, this in the next slide as well. So, well, before we determine the slope and displacement of a point on a beam um, or frame, um, it is usually helpful to sketch the deflected shape of the structure when it's loaded to um, partially check the results. So this deflection diagram, it represents the elastic curve which defines the displaced position of the cross-section along a member. Um, so to determine the deflected shape, it's important to understand certain restrictions to slope and displacement that often occur at a support or connection like I mentioned in the last slide. Um, so for example, supports that resist a moment such as a fixed wall restricts rotation. This is important because um, the angle of rotation is preserved at a fixed support. Um, and on the other hand, on the other hand, um, supports that resist the force, such as a pin, um, resist 
displacement and the angle is not preserved. So as you can see on the top right diagram, the deflection of frame members that are fixed connected uh, causes the joint to rotate the connected members by the same amount, so the two thetas are equal. And the original 90 degree corner remains 90 degrees after um, deflection. So the blue uh, corner, that's, that's a deflected shape. Um, um, even though the beams are bending a bit, the corner uh, is still a 90 degrees. Whereas um, the diagram on the bottom, um, if a pin connection is used as a joint, the members will each have a different slope or rotation at the pin since the pin cannot support a moment. So a theta one is not equal to theta two. Um, so sometimes uh, it's hard to draw the elastic curve uh, intuitively. Um, and you can draw the moment diagram first uh, for the beam or frame. So uh, first of all, uh, for uh, our sign convention, we choose a positive moment um, as a moment that, be that bends the beam upward, whereas a negative moment bends the beam downward. Um, and also as a result, the sh if, the, if you know the shape of the moment diagram, it will be easy to construct the elastic curve and, and vice versa. So for example, if you look at the beam on the left with its associ associated moment diagram on the, um, right below it, you'll see that uh, due to the uh, pin and roller support that attaches the beam to the ground, the displacement at point A and D are zero. And also within the region of negative moment, the elastic curve is concave downward, like I mentioned. Um, in the last slide, because a, a, neg a negative moment creates a downward um, deflection. And within the region of positive moment, the elastic curve is concave upward. Um, so you can see that there is a correlation between moment and deflected shape, and that's very important. Um, and also, uh, there must be an inflection point um, at the point where the curve changes from concave down to concave up, since this is the point of zero moment. And you can see that the, the deflection curve for the beam on the right is drawn using the same principles that I explained based on the moment diagram. And as um, I mentioned before, um, since the, the left end of the beam is fixed to the wall, the initial slope of the beam is horizontal to preserve that 90 degree angle at um, a fixed connection. Um, so here is a more complex example with frames. Um, so in the first diagram, uh, when you apply a load P that pushes joints B and C to the right, it will cause clockwise rotation of each column. So as a result, joints B and C must rotate clockwise. Um, and since, um, the nine degree angle between the connected members um, has to be maintained as joints. The beam BC will deform so that its curvature is reversed from concave up on the left to concave down on the right. And this also produces a point of inflection within the beam BC. Um, and the same thing happens in the second diagram. Um, B would display joints B, C, and D to the right, causing each column to bend. And the fixed joints must maintain their nine degree angles. So B and C, uh, B, C, and C, D have to have a reverse curvature with an inflection point near the midpoint. I have a couple more frame examples because um, it's going back to, to our club, um, the towers that we make, we assume that the connections are fixed instead of pinned. Um, so so in, instead of acting like a truss, our tower um, is acting more like a frame. So that's why I have um, so many of these frame examples. But um, if you look at the one on the left, the vertical loading on the frame will bend the beam CD upwards, um, which causes clockwise rotation of joint C and counterclockwise rotation of joint D, 
And since yeah. 90 degree angle, the joints have to be maintained, um, the columns bend like as shown in the diagram. Um, so but for the frame on the right, you'll, you'll notice that there is um, joint C is pinned, not fixed. You can see there's like a tiny silver circle thing that just um, shows that it's a pinned connection. So um, you can see that the 90 degree angle is not conserved at C. And as a result, um, beam CD does not have a reverse curvature like uh, all the other beams. Um, so as I've mentioned before, um, if you want to quantify the amount of flexion, um, there are two important differential equations that can be used to relate the internal moment in a beam to the displacement and slope of its elastic curve. So these equations um, form the basis for um, some methods that are used to calculate deflection. Um, and there, there um, are a few of them, but we won't go into detail about the specific methods in this presentation um, for the interest of time. But um, if we assume that the, um, and also to explain or to to to, to establish the um, the elastic beam theory, we'll have to assume that the beam is slender so that um, its length is much greater than its depth, um, and the the greatest the, the greatest deformation will be caused by bending. So deflections caused by shear will not be discussed in this presentation or in this theory. Um, and we'll also assume that plane sections remain plane after deflection. So when the, um, yeah, so for the elastic beam theory, when the internal moment, um, which is um, shown as M, deforms the beam, uh, the angle between them becomes d theta, as you can see, um, is there a point here? Um, here, d theta, um, and the radius curvature for this arc is defined as the distance rho here, which is measured from the center of curvature rho prime to dx. So if the material is homogeneous and um, behaves in like a, in a linear elastic manner, um, you can apply the Hooke's law. Um, and we can also apply the effect flexor formula, um, which might be unfamiliar for some of you if you haven't taken solid mechanics, um, but that's okay. Hopefully it will become clear after our solid mech tutorial on Saturday. Um, but yeah, anyways, um, if you combine these equations um, and substitute them into uh, the above equation, these equations, um, and, and after some manipulation, you can find the solution um, to the, you can find that the, the solution to the equation in this blue box will give the exact, exact shape of the elastic curve. So once you express the moment as a function of position x, um, then you can, you can integrate um, the, the previous equation in that blue box that I mentioned um, and produce the beam's slope theta um, and the equation of the elastic curve V. So for each integration, we need to introduce a constant of integration um, and, that, uh, and then solve for the constants to get a, a unique solution for the problem. And um, to determine the constants of integration, we'll need to um, evaluate the functions for uh, the functions at a particular point on the beam where the value is a function, where we know the value of the function. So these values are called boundary conditions. And um, so for example, if the beam is supported by a roller or a pin, then, um, then it's, it's required that the displacement is zero at these points. And we can use um, that information to find the constant of integration. So here is an example on double integration um, as, where we use um, the double integration method to solve for the 
rotation and deflector shape of a beam. So as you can see, the load um, deflects the beam upward um, and creates a moment M, M0. Um, and the internal moment can be represented throughout the beam using a single S coordinate, as you can see um, on the top, right? So from the, um, I guess, free body diagram, um, since M is acting in a positive direction, um, we have M equals M naught, so that's this equation, and we integrate it twice here, um, and that's how we get uh, the equation in the middle. And we now we use um, boundary conditions, dv over dx equals zero because um, uh, the rotation is zero at the fixed end. So at x equals zero and also v equals zero. So the deflection is also of zero at the fixed end. We get that the constants um, of integration are also zero. Um, so we substitute these results back um, and we get the final two functions for the rotation. So theta, um, like this equation is the, the equation for, for rotation and then the one below is uh, for deflection. And uh, I also mentioned that we have a um, fixed moments chart. So this isn't directly related to deflections, but it's a pretty handy chart to have. Um, so say if you want to find the, the, the fixed moments um, for a particular beam, um, you can just um, refer to this chart and there are certain loading conditions that are pretty common you see. So if you can find the loading condition that, that, that you're looking for, you can easily substitute in the parameters or the, the variables and then find the fixed moments that you're looking for. So that is actually all I have for today. Um, went a little bit faster than what I expected, um, but I think um, 20 minutes is, is a good time to stop. So um, if you actually want to learn about the, like the specific methods that um, we use to calculate the amount of deflection based on um, the equation for the deflected shape, um, I can look into putting up like another tutorial for that. But yeah, that's all I have for now. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask.